Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Brever and alongside me is Logan Camden. And today we're going to be talking about some early season NBA standouts, both good and bad. And we're going to sort of break it down by category. So let's start with this, Logan. Which contender has been the most impressive to you relative to your preseason expectations? Relative to my preseason expectations, I think it has to be the Phoenix Suns. And I know they've struggled here early, but they've been without Devin Booker and Bradley Beal mm -hmm. for some of this uh, season. And I will say the Spurs loss inexplicable last night, man. Uh, I was baffled, as was the entire city of Phoenix walking down the streets. Uh, it was a night of disappointment as the Diamondbacks also lost to the Rangers in the World Series. But... Uh, the Suns' loss was way more inexplicable, man. I've never seen that. The Suns lead all the way, wire to wire. And Frank Vogel says, ah, let's just not advance the ball. Let's let Katie get trapped in the corner. Katie got big-bodied. Dude, I've never seen that in all my years of watching the NBA, a, an NBA game stolen away like that. But relative to expectation, I had the Suns as my sixth seed, and I was really concerned uh, about a few things, primarily their depth, how their role guys were going to fit alongside their superstars, and their defense. But they've honestly dispelled a lot of the issues that I had with them preseason. I, we've said this on a few shows because we've talked about the Suns a little bit. They're a hot-button team. Their defense and their depth, I, I really like. I think they got a lot of dogs up and down their roster that just make hustle and effort plays, man. Uh, if it's not Josh Okogie one night, it's Grayson Allen making plays, or it's Jordan Goodwin and again, save one game, they've been without Bradley Beal and Devin Booker. I think we see the biggest issue is just offensive creation outside of Kevin mm -hmm. Durant, him carrying the burden of having the entire team on his shoulders. You know, you're routinely expecting Eric Gordon to step up. It's not 2011 anymore. I don't want Eric Gordon to have to step up and give me buckets. That's not going to be the reality of the Suns roster once these guys get fully healthy. They're going to have arguably more offensive creation than any other team in the league in their top three. And it's going to be really seamless. And I think all of these guys are going to work well together. Now, is the fit going to be good enough to take down a team like the Nuggets? Is their depth and defense going to be good enough? I don't know yet. Bottom line is I think they're going to be better than the sixth seed. And I think that once Beal and Book get back, it fixes most of their major issues. I really trust the depth here. I really trust the defense. And I trust the dogs to go out there and make plays around the superstars. So Phoenix, for me, uh, I know it's been a disappointing start record-wise. They're just 2-2, two and two, and again, they get that game stolen from them from San mm -hmm. Antonio last night. I really like Phoenix moving forward, and I think I underestimated them more than any other contender in the NBA. And you were definitely lower on Phoenix mm -hmm. than the consensus. I don't know if the needle has really been moved for me with them. It's tough to have a precise evaluation of a team that's down two of its three best players. So yeah, their most glaring shortcoming is that big time shot creation, but that's exactly the role that those two guys will fill. But throughout the offseason, I talked about how impressed I was with their ability to build out competent depth pieces, even guys who I legitimately liked with very limited resources. I've been mm -hmm. impressed by this team defensively. I think... Nurk, right, isn't a great all-around defender, but his ability at least to have a high impact on the glass has been valuable. If you worried about this team getting bullied in some of those interior categories with a disengaged Aiton out there, mm -hmm. Nurk is preventing that. They've been a good rebounding team. They've been a pretty good interior defense in terms of opponent field goal percentage at the rim, and then you have point of attack guys like uh, Okogi, who is obviously mm -hmm. a dog, we talk about the bench. I like Eubanks bringing that rim protection. Yuta Watanabe just has that strap on him at all times. <laughs> They're a legitimately good basketball team. And I think that they are doing a good job in the categories that were viewed as the most concerning for them. That being their defense. That being the contribution of their role, guys. So I give props to them there. Who I have been more impressed by, though, is actually a team that the Suns beat on opening night, but that has looked really, really stellar since then. And that is the Golden State Warriors. And Steph Curry is doing crazy stuff. He mm -hmm. is just putting on shot-making displays that only he can. Two of the last three games, he's gone for 40-plus. Even his off night in that stretch against the Rockets, he had the four straight threes to seal it. Like, what he is doing night to night, what Luka Doncic is doing night to night, what Jokic mm -hmm. are doing night to night. All of these guys are among the greatest offensive players to ever play. They are a tier above the rest of the league in terms of offensive production. Just absolute joys to watch. But Steph Curry 
is plus 12 this year, Logan. When he is on the floor, wow. the Warriors have outscored the opposing team by 12 points. The Dubs are plus 31 without him. And that, to me, is a testament to the totality of this roster that the Warriors have built. In the entirety of Steph's career, the Dubs have outscored the opposing team with him off the floor over an entire season just twice. By one point per 100 possession in 2018 when they had a fellow named Kevin Durant and by 0.1 points per possession in 2022, which is completely negligible. So, of course, we're looking at a very small sample size, but this is a second unit that looks like the best of Steph Curry's career. And I really did like their offseason. I liked the CP trade, bringing in a much more stable veteran presence who could command that second unit, which has been such an issue. I liked their draft, getting a very pro-ready guy like Trace Jackson Davis. We talked about that being maybe the value pick of the draft at 57, a guy who fit into their system offensively in Brandon Podzemski, having a full season of Gary Payton the second back. There were lots of moves on the margins that I liked. But I didn't quite expect it to have this level of an impact on this second unit and the overall outlook of this team. You could not have a better bench captain than Chris Paul at this mm -hmm. stage in his career. It's just the perfect role. And I still don't really like his fit alongside Steph just because he's not the most comfortable spot up shooter. He's not a guy who's going to really fit in to the motion offense. But when you are talking about a unit that has historically been disjointed that has been lacking for offensive skill and creation you run chris ball pick and roll you are pretty much guaranteed a mid-range pull up which is a decent look for him or a decent look for the roller or a shooter like he is just so good at making the right decision and even if he's not warping a defense like he used to and he doesn't have that quickness and rim pressure he's still going to get to that free throw line area if he draws a second defender he'll make the right read and if not He'll take that mid-range pull-up, and you're fine with that every time. So it's not necessarily this great, super dynamic offense, but it's reliable. He's a steadying presence. It's going to be a low turnover second unit, which is a blessing for the Dubs <laughs> historically. So it's just such an upgrade from the chaos of years mm -hmm. past. But it's not just CP3, man. It really is the totality of this supporting cast. You have the additions, but then you also have the improvement of a guy internally like Moses Moody, who is playing really good basketball right now, shooting the hell out of it. But even more so than that, he's been more confident and more mm -hmm. willing to shoot it than ever, knocking down 41% of his threes, but also taking over four attempts per game. I like seeing that aggression and confidence from him. He's running the floor well in transition, and he's giving tons of effort defensively, mm -hmm. covering lots of ground on closeouts. Having Gary Payton the second back for a full season is just so huge. He's an elite point of attack defender and then offensively just fits in smart cutter, capable shooter, good decision maker. That's 20 quality minutes a night that if the Warriors had for all of last season, maybe they would have been a more well-rounded team with more momentum going in the right direction heading into the postseason. And then Trace Jackson Davis is legitimately good, man. He is a monster on the offensive glass. You see already the ferocity with which he is attacking there. A good finisher. Not the biggest guy, but hyper-athletic. He can get above the rim. And then a very legitimate rim protector on the other side of the ball. Like, if you just look at that athletic impact that the Warriors historically have lacked from their bigs. They don't have those sort of hyper-athletic guys. He's got seven offensive boards and four blocks in 24 minutes. And beyond that, this is a guy who is a high IQ passer. Like, I think he has even more skill that he will continue to show as he carves out a more prominent role, which I do think he deserves. But then Podzemski, mm -hmm. ready to play now, too. You see it in his debut. He's a great rebounding guard. He's a good passer. He's a lethal shooter. He can play out a pick and roll, too, get to his floater. So that's just a big difference from what you were looking at last year, which was a really, really rough second unit a majority of the time. And catching Denver is going to be a different sport. That mm -hmm. is a team that just night in, night out is more polished than everybody else. They have the best offense in the league. Then is when I start to worry about some of the Warriors' issues that they didn't fix so resoundingly, like size and athleticism mm -hmm. in the front court, star offensive creation alongside Steph, because that is a team that is going to be humming all the time. But everybody outside of them has legitimate flaws, and the dubs really are looking like they may have done a best job of solving some of those issues, of rounding out this roster with really strong contributors. And they might be my second favorite team in the West right now. I think that's a good take, Carson. And I was really high on the Warriors coming into this season. Uh, I feel like I was higher on the Warriors than consensus. It's just a, 
a culture and identity, and I buy into Steph Curry as the number one guy. Uh, Steph's been mm-hmm. on one to start this season, man, and Steph's going to have to be on one all playoffs long to carry this team through because I think you're exactly right. He still carries a massive burden night to night to put this team on his shoulders, but I do think this is the best surrounding group. You mentioned you mentioned TJD, and it should be no surprise that he's really you know far along. He's a really polished guy. Uh, four years at Indiana, and I think yeah. that gets really – undervalued in the modern NBA. We get caught up in age, scalability. How good could this guy be in three, four years? And there's some of these Mm -hmm. guys that slip under the radar. You know, TJD was a late first round guy to me. I'm pretty sure he was to you too, or an early second guy. Yes. Even though he was 23. I mean, you could just tell from the tape, he's polished. He's got great feel for the game. He's athletic. He might be a little undersized, but he just, he can play ball. You can stick him out there at the four or five spot and he's going to give you good minutes on a night to night basis. I think the Warriors did crush it. And I think another point about why you should maybe even have more confidence in Golden State moving forward, this is without, in my opinion, their second best player really pulling his weight. Andrew Wiggins has not had a great start to this season, and yet this team is still balling right now. I mean, he's 11 points per game, sub 40% from the field, you know, below 30% from deep. Wiggins is this team's second best player. And once he starts pulling his weight offensively, I mean, I think there's a there's an even higher ceiling this team can reach. Uh, I think you're right. It's going to be about slaying the dragon. I don't know if any team in the NBA is equipped to slow down or stop Denver, but I am just as high on Golden State as you are, man. And that's the biggest difference, dude. This really is the second best unit, maybe, of the Steph Curry era, man. Yeah, it's really strong in terms of depth. I didn't even mention Jonathan Kaminga just because he hasn't had Mm -hmm. the best start to this regular season, but obviously... Really impressive preseason. I just continue to worry about the consistency of his perimeter shot. The fact that he can be very much a black hole offensively, sort of head down, reckless drives to the bucket, limited playmaker, some of the defensive discipline. But I've said since he was a prospect, he's one of the most rare athletes in basketball. Mm -hmm. And I do think he's taking a step forward. Dario Saric, who gives you a different (laughs) look from TJD. He just hasn't really been knocking down his shots so far this year, but the passing IQ, his ability to fit into this ball movement based offense to make decisions as a short roller. He's been good on the glass. Like they have lots of options here down to the deep bench. And that's an asset that Warriors teams in recent years haven't really had. I mean, you don't have to play Anthony Lamb 19 minutes a game, right? Even a guy like Dante DiVincenzo, who I like getting 26 minutes a game was a bit much for this team if they Mm -hmm. wanted to actually win the title. So I feel a lot better about this Warriors team. I thought that they would be better than last year, but they have looked even better than I expected. Okay, outside of that contender tier, which team that maybe you just underestimated, maybe you didn't love, has pleasantly surprised you the most, Logan? I really liked this team. I didn't love them, and frankly, I'm disappointed in myself, Carson. Nobody on the planet watched more Orlando basketball last year Mm. than me. I watched more Orlando (laughs) Orlando Magic basketball the past two seasons than anybody. I would talk to Carson about it, and he'd go, Logan, you're sick in the head. There's something wrong with you. You shouldn't put yourself through that. It's like torture. Well, to be fair, you were also saying this the year before they even had mm-hmm. Paolo. That's you were what... watching rookie Jalen Suggs have a rough go at it. That was some ugly basketball. That's what I'm saying, man. I've been on the magic train for about two years for no really discernible reason other than the fact that I was chilling on my couch at about 4 to 5 o'clock every day. And I'd be sure? like, eh, yeah, I could throw the magic game on right now. Why not? I'll cook up a little dinner to throw on uh, throw on some Jalen Suggs stuff. I watched so much Orlando Magic basketball, and I didn't see this coming. And partly for why I was lower on Orlando was because of the expectations that I had for Paolo offensively. I thought he bared a ton of responsibility. He was going to have to take this massive leap as an offensive number one. And through the start of this season, Paolo's been pretty underwhelming statistically. 13-5-5, and and I didn't know if he was ready for the spotlight. One, let me be clear about some of Paolo. I think he's going to be a lot better throughout this season, and I have been Mm -hmm. impressed with how he's gotten to his looks, how he's looked. The shot just hasn't been falling yet. But what I underestimated was the overall depth offensively around him too, especially Franz Wagner. Franz has been remarkable to start this season. 
Uh, 18, 6, and 3. Not crazy better than he was last season. He's been inefficient. But I've been super impressed with how he's been able to take pressure off of Paolo and his playmaking, especially his chemistry with Mo. When Franz and Mo are on the court together, you can just tell, man, the brotherly chemistry is there, man. They just play so well off of each other. But it's not just Franz, man. I really like Markel Fultz and how he applies rim pressure. Dude, I, I think I just forgot how good of an athlete that Markel Fultz was, man. He is a yeah. really dynamic athlete still at this point in his career. He applies a ton of rim pressure. He's really fast. He's really good at pushing in transition. And shout out Gary Harris, too, man. He's been on an absolute burner. He dropped 17 points versus the Lakers. He's been shooting the hell out of the ball. And while I still have my issues with Jalen Suggs' overall offensive game, there's uh, I did a breakdown on Jalen Suggs when he came into the league. There's still a certain jankiness to his game offensively. He doesn't have the prettiest offensive game in terms of when he's driving the lane or shooting, but I really, really like Jalen Suggs' passing, man. His IQ and his creativity are off the charts. So I think there's a lot more depth in Orlando offensively, and I think that alleviates a lot of pressure off of Paolo. So when he gets back to playing you know, Paolo basketball, efficient, 20 points a night, playmaking, playing good Paolo ball, I think there's a lot of depth behind him that can help carry the weight and make this a good offense. But where I've really been impressed has to be defensively, man. They yeah. have a defensive rating of 103 right now, number two in basketball behind the Clippers. They're just a long, athletic, feisty group. And shout out Jalen Suggs on this side, too. He's a yeah. hustler, a dog. You've got a lot of good point of attack guys in Fultz, Suggs. Uh, you've got good at wings, too, with Wagner, uh, Paolo. They've got good length. Wendell Carter may not be great, but he's strong, and he's a long guy. They're just a... They're just a feisty group, man, that's going to be a hard out every night, and they're all really athletic, and I really think they have good chemistry, man. That's an underrated aspect of playing together the past two years. There hasn't been a whole lot of roster turnover in Orlando the past two years. I know there's been guys in and out on the margins. You've added some star talent, some guys like Franz, some guys like Paolo into the mix, but there hasn't been a lot of turnover, and you just see it night to night. The guys know how to play with each other. They play well mm -hmm. defensively and offensively off of each other. I'm just disappointed in myself. I've been the biggest Orlando Magic advocate over the past two seasons, and I didn't want to push all my chips in on the table this season. I had them right on the outskirts of the playoff picture right behind Indiana, and I'm not out here calling Orlando a legit contender, but I'll tell you right now, I like them more than Indiana, and I might like them more than Atlanta. I think I should have had them in my playoff mm. picture, and I'm I'm upset with myself that I underestimated them, man. I think they're legit nine deep, and I think they can be a plus on both sides of the ball, especially when Paolo gets back to his baseline. I like the Magic. I also feel like this has been pretty much what I expected from them, though. Well, maybe they've been a little bit better defensively, and I give mm -hmm. huge props to their level of activity there, and they're very athletic. They've been one of the best interior defenses in the league, which I did not expect because of Wendell Carter Jr., but he's been getting good support from some of the mm -hmm. other big athletic wings there. They are just busting their ass on that side of the ball, and I thought that they could be a really impressively good defense for such a young core, but being pretty clearly up to this point, a top five defense in basketball. That's really impressive. But my concern with Orlando, why I did view them very much in the same tier as Indiana. I had both these teams winning 40 games as my eight and nine seed. Thought they mm -hmm. were both going to really trend upwards, be fun, but remained flawed. Is that they just don't have that seamless offensive creation still. This is a team that is going to be well below average in terms of shooting. And as much as I like Paolo, is he going to be a very refined, efficient offensive number one in year two? Is he always going to make the right decisions as a playmaker? No, I think it's going to be up and down there. I do love Franz. Uh, this hasn't been the best start to the year for him, but he is just such a phenomenal all-around basketball player. I could praise him over and over and over again and never get tired of it. This is a good basketball team. Very solid. And what they're doing right now defensively is really impressive. But I do still worry about them creating that easy offense, which you really have to if you want to win 45, close to 50 games. And that's the difference, I think, between Indiana and Orlando and why I slightly yeah. prefer Orlando. Indiana, I think, has more of that seamless offensive creation with Halliburton, but I don't think they're as good of a defense. Uh, 
Somebody did a breakdown on Twitter, too. I, I just don't like Halliburton as a point of attack guy late. The Bulls really went at him and mm-hmm. closed that game out. And I think that's the difference is I think Orlando can reach a higher defensive ceiling. I think Indiana can reach a higher offensive ceiling. But I yeah. slightly prefer I slightly prefer Orlando. Well, I think that they're very close, but I don't want to undersell how much higher the offensive ceiling that Indiana can mm-hmm. reach is because up to this point, that's been a top three offense in basketball, and mm-hmm. they are just prototypical pace and space, man. Top five in pace this year, third and three-pointers made at a 37% clip. And Dude, they are hucking. They are yeah. hucking threes. But they've got shooters everywhere, bro, and Especially, some of the depth dude. pieces here are so impressive. Dude, the Halley Turner pick and roll is deadly, man. I'm so glad they yeah. held on to him. Yeah, when Miles Turner's actually out there on the floor for a team that wants to win basketball games, it's very fun. He's a very talented basketball player. And obviously, Bruce Brown is shooting the hell out of it right now. That's not sustainable. But Neesmith has been so good, not just a lethal shooter, but legitimately good attacking closeouts, aggressive in transition. Andrew Nemhard brings that dimension of playmaking, as does TJ McConnell. Buddy Heald, I think we've seen grow a little bit in terms of his playmaking and obviously is one of the most lethal shooters in basketball. Matherin has that crazy athletic ability with those hot pull-up shooting stretches. Like, when you have this amount of shooting, this amount of good athletes and good playmakers and good coaching, especially a playmaker of the caliber of Halliburton who is going to do such a good job of setting up these guys as play finishers... Like, this was the vision. This is why I liked Indiana. I thought they could be really good offensively. I think they Mm -hmm. can maybe be even better than I expected. And then defensively, they're not going to be good, but I do think they can be respectable. So the reason that I gave them just the mental tiebreaker over Orlando in the preseason is because I value that seamless offensive creation a bit more than a higher defensive ceiling that Orlando has when I feel like they're basically equivalent teams overall. But... Both very fun teams, trending in the right direction, should certainly be in the play-in. If they're not, I would be very disappointed Mm -hmm. and could both just make the playoffs, period. I'm going to give a shout-out to a team in the Western Conference, and this is really hammering on the team that I was not so high on angle of it that has looked good so far, and that's the Dallas Mavericks sitting at 3-0. Yeah, man. A big part of this is just that Luka has been out of his mind. He's dropping 39, 11, and 9, whatever it is, on unbelievable efficiency. He can reach a mode where he is legitimately unstoppable. He controls every single possession like one of the best puppet masters, frankly, from the perimeter at this stage of his career, the best puppet master in basketball. And like he's 13 of 19 on step backs. So yeah, when man. he is that unfathomable level of perimeter shot making with what he can do, collapsing the defense, attacking the paint, you really just can't stop him. And that's why he has to be in that tier with Luka Jokic, Steph as the top three offensive players in basketball. His efficiency out of isolation, out of pick and roll, out of post-ups, his brilliance as both a scorer and a playmaker. It's all just mind-blowing. And when he is carrying this offensive load and producing at this level, then the Mavs can have the best offense in basketball, which is what they have right now. And now they won't sustain that over a year because Luca can't do this for an entire year at this level, but they are number one in offensive rating right now. And I do like what they have on the wings from Grant Williams, from Josh Green. Those guys do their jobs. They defend, they knock down shots. Derek Lively has come back to earth a bit since his awesome debut, that crazy level of activity that we saw from him. Really nice rim finishing, but he's still a good fit here. So I think this is a team that has improved from last year, legitimately. And without some of the emotional meltdown that they had and the factors where they really just gave up on the defensive end of the floor, all these things that kept them out of the play-in, I think I may have slightly undersold just how good a backcourt of Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving with competent frontcourt play, competent defensive play can make them. So they are looking better than I expected. No, for sure, man. The Mavericks have been unreal. It's all on Luka's shoulders. I got something planned for Luka later in the show for one of our segments uh, just because he's been so remarkable, but... Mm -hmm. I don't think he can keep this up, and I really do think it's going to be about the consistency of the defense. But I w- think back to Dallas when they made that run in the playoffs where they took down the Suns and went to the Western Conference Finals against the Warriors. 
for a team like Dallas, the offensive ceiling that they can reach, that's not a team that needs to win convincingly in the regular season to make a deep playoff run. They literally just have to open the door and sneak in. Once mm-hmm. they're in the playoffs, your offense goes cold for a couple of games in the playoffs, they can steal a playoff series. You know what I mean? It, if Luka and Kyrie can reach that level for four games, you know, I mean, they could pull off a really big upset against a team that's better than them on both sides of the ball. I wouldn't want to run into the Mavericks in the playoffs yeah. if Luka and Kyrie were on a burner. And I underestimated them too, man. I didn't pick them to make the playoffs, and I think I'm just wrong on that. Yeah, and if you think back to the 2020 season, second year Luka Doncic led what was at that point the best team ever by offensive rating with a supporting cast of Dorian Finney-Smith, THJ, Dwight Powell, KP, who wasn't playing his best basketball. You really cannot underestimate how singularly this man can lead to elite team offense. And I think we are getting a nice reminder of that right now when he was playing through three games as the best basketball player on the planet. He is truly one of the greatest offensive players we have ever seen. And it's a privilege to watch him, and he's doing a great job of elevating this entire team. Okay, which young core has impressed you the most this year, Logan? We've got lots of good Mm -hmm. ones. Who has stood out to you? Uh, Shout out to the Magic and the Pacers, who we already um, Mm -hmm. talked about. But I'm going to go with one that has impressed me because I didn't expect a ton out of them this year, and that's the Detroit Pistons. Uh, Cade has been really phenomenal in his return. I think a lot of people forgot about Cade. Uh, <laughs> Nowadays, everybody want to talk. Shout out Carson. Forgot about Cade, man. The remix is on the way. It's going to be on the album. Uh, 21-3-8. and eight. He's averaging five turnovers a game. Been a little inefficient, but, I mean, he's got such a big responsibility to carry this offense on mm-hmm. his shoulders. But I've been really impressed with the guys around him. And we can start with Jalen Duren, uh, putting up 16-13 and 13 a night. He's tied fourth in rebounds per game. And there's just a lot of really good long athletes here. Uh, Isaiah Stewart, who's averaging 14 and 9 on 42% from the field. I don't know how much longer Beef Stew can shoot 40% from deep, but here, I'm all for it, man. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you've got Asar Thompson balling two man, blocking shots, playing great defense, and crashing the boards. And in an ideal lineup, right? Because they're running Killian Hayes at the two right now, which I don't understand long term. I'm starting Alec Burks for floor spacing, for playmaking, ball handling purposes, or I'm just going to shove Jaden Ivey back out there. Ivey's somehow also over 40%. In an ideal lineup, you've got Cunningham, Ivey, Thompson, Stu, Duran, all great athletes, all, you know, really good, uh, really long guys. Right now, they're number one in rebounds per game. They're number 10 in defensive rating. I just think the Pistons have the type of rebounding and athleticism that is going to swing basketball games, man. That kind Mm -hmm. of dominance that they can instill on the boards, the kind of physical game that they can play, if they can reach an average level offensively, I think they can be really good defensively and on the glass. Like, again, man, it's just, it's hard to match up with that kind of size. Again, I think the swing factor for this team is going to be shooting because, again, I don't know how much longer we can expect uh, the offense to be good in spite of Killian Hayes. I don't know how much longer we can expect Burks, Beef, Stu, and Ivy to be all over 40% from deep. I don't know what we're going to get offensively from Asar the rest of the way. He's a good connecting piece. He's not a great off-ball shooter. So spacing and offensive cohesion and ease is still a concern for me, but defensively, athletically, on the glass every night, the Pistons are going to come to play, and that's going to win them a lot of games in the regular season. I hope they can keep this up offensively. I think the first thing to do is to remove Killian Hayes from your lineup and just bench him completely, stop playing him, Uh, give Mm -hmm. Burks and Ivy some more burn. But I underestimated this team, man. They're a lot further along defensively and athletically than I expected. And again, against teams that are just not there uh, vertically, athletically, that don't have that dimension of a game, the Pistons are going to dominate those teams and win convincingly. Uh, Shout out to OKC Thunder, too. I've been really impressed with them. Uh, I just expected more from them from the jump. Uh, the same goes yeah. for the Pacers and the Magic. But in terms of young cores relative to expectation, the Pistons have truly blown me away to start this year. They have been so impressive defensively, and that's the side of the ball that I did prefer them on coming mm-hmm. into the year. But, man, they're grabbing 55% of available rebounds. They have held opposing teams 10% below their typical field goal mm. percentage around the rim. And when you can play 
not just two bigs, but also a hyper-athletic wing like Asar Thompson who has that level of rebounding value, that ability to block shots. That is really going to give you an outstanding interior defense, especially for such a young core. And I think we got to give props to the two bigs for being able to play together, mm -hmm. for Isaiah Stewart to continue to work on his ability as a floor spacer, and for Jalen Duran, dude. I tweeted about this yesterday because it's such a specific skill, but his willingness and ability to throw entry passes whenever mm -hmm. Isaiah has a mismatch on the interior is so valuable. And overall, his passing is so impressive to me. He's got good vision as a short roller. He is very good in terms of his feel. Like, it doesn't have to be a designed handoff, right? I think that he will be able to initiate those. We've already seen a little bit of it, but those situations where it is just in the moment oh this guy's got a mismatch let me throw a nice touch pass into him off of offensive rebounds he's not just black hole oh my god i gotta put it up no matter how contested it is he's gonna look for a shooter on the perimeter and when you blend that with like this incredible athleticism such an explosive leaper around the rim one of the best offensive rebounders in basketball right now top three there and in second chance points but he's also a very good lob threat I mean, to blend those two skill sets to be a high-end passing big for a young guy and a truly elite athlete, that mm -hmm. is rare. And then to also play as hard as he does. Like, this guy is an awesome motor. He covers tons of ground as a rim protector. People are shooting just 44% mm -hmm. at the rim against him. So he gets so much credit here. I think he is obviously one of the early season standouts in the entire league. He is a foundational piece does such a good job of complementing Cade on both sides of the ball. Like having a defensive anchor like that, having a rim runner like that, but who also has more IQ offensively. It's just a really awesome partner to have for anybody. And then I got to give props to Sar because he is truly a rare defensive guard as a rookie. Like not only is he averaging 10 plus sports per game, but his shot blocking skill set is absurd. And it's remarkable how many of those blocks come on ball like yes he's a good help side rim protector he can come over and make some of those game wrecking plays but just his length his timing like he will stifle guys he's straight up blocked bam on a post up it's just very rare and his motor doesn't stop so i think he could be one of the best shot blocking wings just that one specific skill set ever i think he is going to be an all defense guy in this league and then offensively I mean, he's awesome in transition already, both pushing as a ball handler and as a lob target. He's a smart cutter in the half court. He's shown nice variety as a passer, throwing some lobs. Like, everything that we expected him to be great at off rip, he has been great at. Now, the offensive numbers look ugly because the one thing that we knew was going to be a struggle for him is that half court offensive skill. And we are seeing that. He's ended 10 possessions himself out of pick and roll this year, and he has scored just twice on those possessions. His handle is not as polished as a men's. His touch finishing has been poor, and he's struggling to shoot. He's one of seven from three. So those are the factors that we anticipated he would have trouble with. But man, has he been impressive at the stuff that he's good at. Cade is not going to manufacture the most seamless offense for the entire team right now. It's still not a great spacing situation mm -hmm. when you look at the front court. There's not lots of high-end perimeter skill alongside him, so there's a lot of pressure on him. That's where you see the turnover numbers and some of the scoring and efficiency. I think his jump shots look great. I mean, he's knocking down his pull-up threes. I think he's already one of the premier mid-range shooters in basketball, and he is a damn good passer. He handles that pressure well. There's just a really overwhelming burden on him mm -hmm. offensively, which is why I'm not high on Detroit on that side of the ball right now. But defensively, I think they have a really good foundation. Long-term, I'm very, very excited about them because I especially love Cade and Duran. And Ivy, yeah, it's not great that he's coming off the bench and Killian Hayes is starting because Killian Hayes is terrible at basketball. But he's had nice moments. Like this last game mm -hmm. against OKC, he really looked good as a shot creator, was knocking down some of those pull-up and step-back threes. I definitely think Detroit has stood out. But I mentioned the Thunder, who they just played. That is the most impressive young core in mm -hmm. basketball, and it's really not all that close. Yes, expectations were different, right? Detroit was a team that you think, all right, it's just about moving in the right direction, not a team I really expect to even contend for the play-in. Now they're in those conversations. OKC is a team that I had winning 48 games, being my five seed, but seeing all of these pieces come together is just so beautiful. This is like actual futuristic basketball realized right in front of us. 
you think about whenever you see some sort of distant future world in a movie or whatever, there's always either a utopian society as a product of that technological advancement and what have you, or dystopian, more often dystopian. And that would be like the Toronto Raptors who mm -hmm. thought, oh my God, what if we get all these super athletic wings together and they forgot about the half court skill part of it. They forgot about the shooting part of it. OKC has managed to put together a team that yes, has big dudes who can defend multiple positions, but who are also high level ball handlers, who are very good passers, all of whom who can shoot, who are versatile, who have the right mentality. And it's just such an accomplishment. But the single guy who I've been most thrilled to see out there is just Chet Holmgren, mm -hmm. who I said was my favorite prospect who I'd ever evaluated when he came out in the draft. He was my favorite guy in that class. Before he had even set foot on an NBA floor for real, when we did our top 10 guys under 25 to build around this offseason, I had him at number six. Like I have been so, so high on him as a generational defensive talent and the perfect complementary offensive big man. And he is off to an awesome start. Like you see really unique shooting versatility for a guy his size. Mm -hmm. Pick and pop looks. Shooting the corner three as a rookie center. That's rare stuff. His ability to shoot the three as a trailer in transition. Yeah, like he's so, so comfortable there. You've seen a couple nice drives from him. Comfortable putting the ball on the floor. So he just fits in perfectly offensively as a spot up guy in transition. As a pick and roll weapon. But defensively is where he stands out the most. He is already an elite shot blocker. He is so great at maintaining verticality. He has obscene length, both as a helper and one-on-one. -on -one. Like, of course, he's not the strongest guy, but he can hold up in those situations because of his overwhelming length. He can block jumpers. He's got really good hands. You've seen that with the steel production so far. And when he's matched up with Evan Mobley out there, they played the Cavs head-to-head. -head. Chet had seven blocks in that game. I legitimately think he's the better basketball player Right now, he is just already lapping Mobley in terms of offensive skill, the comfort as a shooter and as a ball handler. He's a smoother, more fluid mover and athlete. And defensively, as a pure rim protector, he's already better. He has better physical tools. I think he has even better mm -hmm. instincts. So those are guys who I both loved as prospects. But it's a bit concerning for Mobley just how it feels like he's been relatively stagnant. And it's also really impressive for Chet having this level of impact four games into your rookie season. Mm -hmm. And then I also like some of the depth additions here. Kaysan Wallace, who you loved in the draft, super pro ready guys, barely missed a shot this year. Usman Jang, who I talked about. It's crazy how easily you can forget about a Thunder lottery pick from a year <laughs> ago when they just have so many. But I think his comfort as a shooter is really impressive. The flashes of playmaking you see from him. He's ready to play actual minutes now. And considering how much of a project he was as a prospect, that alone is impressive. Mm -hmm. Isaiah Joe was an elite shooter. Like the totality of this roster is so impressive. And then of course they have a top 10 player in SGA. Jalen Williams is the perfect complement to him. Versatile on and off ball. Giddy as an on ball passer, as a guy in transition. They're just oozing, oozing with talent. And they have the right culture. They have the right coaching. They're committed to playing on the defensive end. Everything is coming together just as it was visualized. And that is very, very fun to see. It's very fun. I'm, I love watching the Thunder play. And just to hyper-focus on a few additional things, Jang, man, I've been really impressed with his cutting off ball too, man, his mm -hmm. willingness to find the bucket. And then the one thing I get think that gets lost with Chet, because I've been blown away, like you, with a lot of his stuff, the, the interior rim protection, the trailing with threes, like he just makes pull-up threes look so easy. The thing that I think gets lost in all this with all of his skills and talent, dude, Chet has some of the highest basketball IQ I think I've ever seen. Like he just, yes. he knows where to be. He, yes. it's remarkable. Like he's so aware and it's when you can have all these traits, the length, the, the positioning, the, the shot, you know, knowing where to be is such a valuable skill. And he's just so aware of like, I need to box this guy out. I need to close out on this guy. His head mm -hmm. is on a swivel and he's making plays, man. Chet is, Chet's super smart, and I can't think of a better start. And I'm so glad, man, because it's like, I don't know what it was, man, if it was because he was a top draft pick, how hyped up he was, the skill set. A lot of people, it seemed like after he got hurt his rookie year, were almost preying on his downfall or something like that. Or yeah. I don't get why he got the hate that he does. Chet has been remarkable in four games, and I hope he continues, man. Uh, he's a lot further along than I expected him to be in his rookie season. 
Chad has always, it feels like, been sort of misunderstood more than anything. I've talked about this before, but him being advertised as a prospect is like the next Kevin Durant. When that's not at all what he was. He's not a wing. He's an elite defensive prospect, truly generational, who then also has this high-end offensive skill for a big man. And then I guess he's really skinny and people love just saying, oh, that guy's going to get hurt. Everybody loves that being their default for why this prospect can't work. Think about it. Anybody who was a Wemby detractor, and I'm not saying these are serious NBA people, mm -hmm. but just people who I guess want to have an opinion. What's their one point? Oh man, he's going to get hurt. You've never seen a guy be healthy at that size. And it's like, all right, I guess that's a concern, but that's going to be your focus. That's going to be the mm -hmm. whole basis of your take. And it's sort of the same thing with Chet. And then he does get hurt, but he's a special talent. And I'm really happy to see him doing it out there on an NBA floor. NBA fans, the wait is over. Basketball is back, and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA, is celebrating with an unbeatable offer. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets for throwing down $5 on the NBA. Win or lose, it doesn't matter. You'll start the season with an instant dub. And with DraftKings parlays, everyone's got a shot at even bigger basketball wins. String together multiple bets from the same game or build your parlay across multiple games for a shot at making your payday even sweeter. Basketball is more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code NERDS. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5 only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code NERDS. The crown is yours. All right, so we talk about how impressive Chet has been, but that's within the context of just OKC as a whole. Which individual player, Logan, in the entire league has surprised, impressed you the most up to this point? I'll keep it brief because we already touched on him. Uh, Luka has been unreal to start this season, man. Yeah. 39-12-10 and 10 on 56-49 splits, and I just don't want to take him for granted. He garners... Like you said, the third most attention of any superstar in basketball, uh, next to Jokic and Curry, and I think you could argue uh, up there with them in terms of control of the game to start it off. Absolutely. Man. I mean, number one in offensive rating. He's number one in points per game. He's number three in assists per game. And it's just, it's beautiful, man. He's so patient. He plays so slow and in control. Luke is 100 percentile in isolation, 91st percentile as a pick-and-roll ball handler. You talk about it, man. 71% on step backs right now. He's shooting 68% on step back threes, dude. I, the, the stepping off of his right foot into that step back three, it's just so smooth. He's got such great touch on those shots. The playmaking's been unreal. The alley-oop lobs, the behind-the-back passes on drives. There's just so many eyes always on Luka. Yeah. And he weaponizes that so well. I just don't want to take it for granted because luca has been doing this for a few seasons now, and it's just like, I don't know, man. We can tend to forget. We can tend to just be like, oh, you know, Luca's doing Luca stuff. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, I want to give a shout-out to a couple other guys, too. Russell Westbrook, who played another awesome game the other night. I've loved how he's weaponized his strength. We've talked about this, but uh, we talked about this on last show. But if Russ can do this on a night-to-night -night basis, I mean, you're looking at a team that with James Harden now – I don't want to overhype Russ too much because I, it's lingering for me, Carson. It scares me that the bottom could drop mm -hmm. out on Westbrook. You're looking at a team that maybe has four top 100 NBA players in Kawhi, PG, Harden, and Russ. If Russ can continue playing like this, that's really valuable to have. And then your boy, Cam Thomas, I just want to give a brief shout out to. I mean, oh, well, no, no, no. Let me do the honors. Let me do the honors. Right. You don't need to take any Cam Thomas mic time away from me, Ooh. pal. Luca Luca makes it a remarkable look routine, and I just want to give him an extra shout out for that. But go ahead, man, take the floor. Your boy Cam Thomas has been balling. Well, I'll give some props to Luca first because he is, I think, clearly a top two passer on the planet at this stage. Jokic is one, but when you consider Luca's brilliance as a skip passer, his ability to see everything out of pick and roll, you mentioned some of the crazy stuff over the head behind the back like he legitimately has effectively unrivaled vision his brilliance as a law passer just his complete manipulation of the defense and control out of pick and roll and ability to make every single pass in the books i think he's got to be top two at this point he does more to actively enhance his teammates than a guy like chris paul who's always going to make the right decision he is just doing it with so much more volume than a guy like lebron at this point you got to give him the edge he's a true genius and then he's also probably a top two scorer. 
Like, I think him and Steph are very, very close there. I think Jokic is the most consistently unstoppable scorer, as we've talked about before, because of how much he can dominate the interior. But Luka is a basically unstoppable paint-scoring guard who then also has these unbelievable flame-throwing runs from mm -hmm. the perimeter who can eat up free throws but doesn't need to necessarily because he's such a great touch shot maker. If you're a top two scorer and a top two passer on the planet, guess what? You are really historically great. Luka has a chance to be on the offensive Mount Rushmore. He really does, and he's definitely making his case right now. But you know who's almost right up there with him, Logan, in terms of points per game this year, who's dropping over 30 mm -hmm. a night like it's mm -hmm. nothing, is the boy Cam Thomas. I love Cam Thomas. I always have. I made a whole YouTube video after he was drafted, and that's about how he was the steal of the draft. And he is just such a uniquely gifted pure scorer. He's averaging the second most isolation points per game right now, and he is literally one of the shiftiest dudes on the planet. He is so twitchy as a mover. He is constantly throwing head fakes. He's just so deceptive. And when you combine that with like actually pretty good athleticism, not standout, but he's just so tough to stay in front of. And then he also has a crazy bag in terms of his ability to create separation as a perimeter shot maker. He creates some of the most space on his step back of anybody and he maintains his balance as he takes these ludicrously large steps. That's a crazy asset. And then he's also a good short range touch shot maker. He's seven of 10 on floaters this year, small sample size, but like he's historically good from that range. And he is an expert foul drawer. This has always been a calling card of Cam Thomas's. Whenever he's gone on these ridiculous scoring runs, you'll see it's, oh my God, he dropped 40 and he also took 17 free throws at LSU. First of all, he was a historically great scoring freshman. Mm -hmm. He led the SEC in scoring as a freshman, which I can't remember how long it had been, but only a few dudes have done that. And his free throw rate was astronomical. And that has just remained a great skill of his. He's so good at manipulating defenders. He's so crafty, so unpredictable with his movements. He's going to get a guy jumping. He's going to get a guy out of position. He's going to make somebody panic. And that's valuable for raising your floor night tonight as a scorer. So Cam has been a tough-ass bucket. Like, <laughs> it's crazy, but this really isn't that surprising to me. Mm -hmm. Whenever he has had a high-volume offensive role, he has gone crazy as a scorer. But... He hasn't really justified big minutes up to this point. Last year and the year before that, obviously, the Nets had a lot more offensive skill because they had Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, at least for half of last year. But it's been about his limitations as a playmaker, where he still doesn't pass much. And it's been about his defensive limitations, where he's still not great. He has fine physical tools, but he's just not a very high IQ defender. He's slow reacting to kickouts. He just makes mistakes. And so if he's a liability there and if he's a liability overall as a playmaker, then there's still only so much value he can actually bring to you. But he is so good as a pure scorer that if he keeps getting starter level minutes, I mean, he will drop 20 a night on very solid efficiency. He's great as an isolation and pick and roll scorer. The question is just how solid can he be in the other categories of his game to where he's like a legitimately high impact basketball player? Because at the end of the day, as tough a bucket as Cam is, a lot of dudes can get buckets if you give them the ball a lot. Now, not quite like Cam, but to be a really high-impact all-around wing basketball player, you still have to do more. You have to weaponize the defensive attention you demand to amplify the guys around you. And that's just sort of my concern with the Nets offense as a whole that we've talked about. It's not their lack of individual scoring talents. Mm -hmm. McCall is a tough-ass bucket. But if you have a bunch of guys who are just going to go out there and isolate run pick and roll and pretty much only get tough buckets themselves i mean they can be awesome they can be really fun to watch but there's something missing from that offense in terms of high-end playmaking like any one guy just scoring out of isolation isolation is an inherently inefficient play type so there's a limitation to the team's offensive ceiling when those are how your best players play but I don't want to hold Cam to an unrealistic standard and say the guy's got to be an all-around star because here he is, year three. He was the 27th pick of the draft somehow, and he's doing what he does, getting buckets like he's done his whole life. Shout out Cam. Cam Thomas is wired to get buckets, and I just want to tip my cap to you, Carson. Carson Brebber knows a bucket when he sees a bucket, man. He can identify a bucket. When a dude Thanks, scores, bro. 
he can tell. Uh, Cam's been unreal, and I also like what you mentioned with his free throw too, dude. I, I just love the way that Cam leans into physicality. He doesn't shy away from it on defenders. Like, mm-hmm. He wants you to draw that, to, and he's going to use it to get to the rack or to, for the step back. And I don't want to overhype the Nets too much, but hear me out. You get a playmaker in here, you do get a point guard, a guy that can set the table for everybody. I don't think mm-hmm. the Nets are that far off. If you yeah. have a guy that is night-to-night 20-25 to 25 alongside Macau Bridges, because both of those guys are buckets, you got a good tertiary guy in, uh, in uh, Cam Johnson. You get a playmaker in here, man. Like, there's enough scoring upside with the defensive ceiling that I think this team can reach with all of their length. I'm not saying they're going to be a playoff contender or anything like that, but they're going to be a tough out every single night, man, and they're going to be on the fringes of making that playoff push. I'd lean into it, dude. I'd give Cam hella minutes. I'd start him the rest of the season, dude. Like, I don't know what else he could do. He's he's one of the craftiest buckets I've seen, and I cannot believe I underestimated him, man. I didn't like him because I just thought that I don't know why I didn't like Cam Thomas, man. I don't know what I don't know what was up with that take. That was a pretty cold one by me. Uh, Cam's awesome, dude, and I don't know, maybe a little most improved sprinkle, dude. It seems like he could oh, be. Oh yeah, he could be for sure the the front runner for that award. I, maybe him or Duran, uh, but uh, from relative to expectation, I figure Cam probably has to be the front runner at this point. Well, Cam's gonna make a much better case than Duran because. He's a third-year guy mm-hmm. versus a second-year guy, and they really don't like to give the award to second-year guys. And, I mean, he just has upside for more explosive offensive production. Some of the stuff that Duran's going to do, it's not going to show up in terms of scoring. Most of his value is mm-hmm. going to be the rim protection, the rebounding, the standout passing for his age and position, and then really efficient finishing offensively. But Cam can easily drop 20-plus a night. And, again, do it with very solid efficiency. That's mm-hmm. what I want to emphasize. Cam is not a shot chucker. Cam is a tough ass bucket. He will take your favorite player and he will give that man work. And that's really fun. And listen, I was worried about the Nets offense coming into this year. They've been good so far. That is overwhelmingly because of Cam and what he's doing. They're also shooting the ball really well, better than I would probably expect. So this is a team that I didn't love coming into the year, but listen, if they're going to give my guy Cam minutes like this, let him do his thing, then shit, I got to ride with the Nets. Shout <laughs> out to him. Last thing I want to give a shout out to here, somebody else who I just briefly mentioned as sort of a long shot, most improved candidate when we were talking about that award, Jalen Johnson has been awesome oh, yeah. for the Hawks. I mean, he's putting up like 15 a night, explosive athletic finisher, awesome in transition. His shot looks way better than it has the last couple years. We saw that in preseason. Now we've seen it, small sample size, but he's knocking down 40% of his threes. So he's a weapon as a spot-up guy, as a pick-and-pop guy. And then he's a legitimately skilled ball handler, legitimately good passer, defensively versatile, athletic, averaging two and a half stocks a game. He's a guy who can actually raise Atlanta's ceiling because of his versatility on both sides of the ball he's just a damn good basketball player and I'm very happy for him dude we've been saying this for uh, I feel like a year now shout out Jalen Johnson man he was an OG nerd session man I remember when we did Mm -hmm. (sighs) man dude I don't know how long ago that show was had to be two years at this point you know we were doing throwing out guys like Josh Giddy and and Johnson Davion Mitchell is some of our favorite Mm -hmm. underrated guys Sin Goon I remember uh Mm-hmm. but I, we've been saying for the past year or two that we thought that maybe Atlanta had sleepers on their bench that might be better than their starters, a Kong Wu over Capella, Johnson yeah. over John Collins. And, you know, not in terms of you know just being good players, but in terms of winning impact, uh, shout right. out him, man. He's I'm glad that he's getting burned in this rotation. And there's a lot of young talent that I like in Atlanta too, man. A.J. Griffin, shout out. Uh, yeah. I, I, I like Atlanta's depth a lot, man. Yeah, well, when you can athletically finish at the rim and you can shoot and you can pass and you can defend multiple positions, that's a basketball player who anybody wants, but that's a basketball player who especially works well alongside one Trey Young. So, fun to see that. All right, we've done a lot of raving, Logan. Lots of positive standouts. We're going to end on a bit more of a negative note. Who was a team that you thought would be playoff caliber or that generally people expected to be in that range that has disappointed you the most? Maybe this is a bit of a cop-out in terms of what they've done in the regular season and years previous, but I'm going to say the Miami Heat. And 
the reason I say this is, uh, one, I, I ask myself the question, should I really even be surprised? In the Jimmy Butler era, the Miami Heat have won 50 games one time. Right now, they've opened up 1-3. and three. They're 22nd in offensive rating and 20th in defensive rating. And my thing with the Heat was regular season, oh, they're going to coast. They're going to win 42 games. You know, they'll sneak into yeah. the playoffs. And maybe they'll upset a high seed again because that's what the Miami Heat do. They overachieve in the playoff setting. My concern with Miami this year is with the departure of some of their depth pieces, the Gabe Vincents of the world, the Max Struess, uh, the Max Struces of the world, I wonder if we have cause for concern for regular season regression to the point that maybe this team misses the play-in or misses the playoffs, right? I don't know if Jimmy Butler can exert himself on a nightly basis the way they need him to to dominate mm-hmm. the regular season. In years previous, they've had a requisite depth level of guys that can score you 10 to 15 points a night, that can elevate their level, that can carry you through to where Jimmy and Bam don't have to exert themselves. They can play, you know, decent defense, and these guys can carry them through. They don't have that as a luxury this season, and I wonder if it's going to come back to bite them. But point blank, they've been disappointing to start this year. Jimmy, 15-7-4 on 33% uh, from the field. Hero's been the only guy to write home about. They've only got four guys in double-digit scoring. Duncan, Jimmy, Bam, and Hero. The depth guys have not been great. Kevin Love has looked pretty poor. Kyle Lowry's looked like Kyle Lowry. So I just wonder, with other teams improving in the East, uh, Mm -hmm. Indiana, Orlando, maybe Chicago is sneaky again this year and can climb up in the same tier as Miami. I wonder if they have an outside chance of missing the playoffs. I will give them credit for this. Uh, I thought against Milwaukee, I thought they showed a lot of fight against them. They trailed mm-hmm. 103 to 78 in that game. They go on a 24-8 run in the fourth quarter. They outscore them by 16 in the fourth. And Jimmy Butler does not play the fourth quarter at all. That was the Heat bench in Tyler Hero going to work. Hero's really impressed me. He's averaging 25, 5, and 3 to open the season. He put up 35, 8, and 3 versus the Bucks. I've liked his playmaking. I've liked his creation out of pick and roll, and I've liked his pull-up shooting. I've always liked Tyler Hero, but he's impressed me now that he's back. And I do want to touch on that with the Bucks, man. The Bucks still concern me late in games, man. Uh, this is a tangent from the Heat, but Beasley and Giannis both go 0 of 2 from the free throw line late in this game. Giannis gets a five-second violation. And it's just still, for me, a little too much late Giannis uh, for the Bucks. Damian Lillard is your best player in the clutch. Go to him. I want him not only touching the ball and creating out of pick and roll, and he has a turnover late in this game too, but I don't care. Give him the ball and let him go to work. Uh, I either want him playmaking and creating a shot for somebody else, or I want him shooting. Giannis should not touch the ball this much late in crunch time, and I thought that's why Miami was able to make this comeback. Sure, he hits a late three to close this game out. Uh, Milwaukee left the door wide open for Miami in this game. Again, the margin was too great. They were never going to lose that game. But they left the back door wide open in that game for Miami to make a comeback. And I thought they should have put Jimmy in. But I think that's a real concern for me, Carson, with the la- with the loss of the depth pieces they've had. Guys night to night that can drop 10 to 15. I don't think that's a luxury Miami has this year. And I really worry if it's going to come back to bite them and if it's going to reflect that in the regular season standings with the improvement from other other teams out east. I think they have a culture. They have an identity that I can bank in. I'm not going to predict them to miss the playoffs, but I think it's a real concern. I'm just not really comfortable saying that when the two guys who are best suited to fill that role as those solid wings who can bring you some all-around value have barely played. Like, we've seen Josh Richardson in one game. We've seen Caleb Martin in one game. Those are the guys who are supposed to be important to the depth on the wings. Hawk as to... He's been all right. I mean, the Heat haven't looked good, but a lot of that I think is just Jimmy has sucked. They've actually played teams relatively tight when you consider that. They had a crazy shooting game against the Celtics, but they played them tight. They played the Bucks tight, as you mentioned, with Jimmy being a bad and a non-factor down the stretch in that game. So I'm not going to make any sweeping takes about the Heat. No, they are not the most talented team in basketball. It is possible that they could struggle enough throughout the regular season to produce consistently good offense to miss the playoffs, especially if Jimmy 
has an injury, then I just don't think they're equipped with other high level mm -hmm. creators to weather that storm. I'm just not going to bet on it. I think that they'll reach a high enough level defensively. I think Jimmy will do enough. I think these wings will play well enough. I can see your concern. I just don't want to overreact to four regular season games when it's the Miami Heat. I think there's a pretty clear choice here, and that is the Memphis Grizzlies, who I was really low mm -hmm. on coming into this year. I've always been low on them, but with the jaw suspension, how that hampers their transition offense, which has always been their identity on that side of the ball, and then also eliminating their best half-court offensive talent, their most dynamic creator, concerning... And then losing Steven Adams for an entire year, who was such an important defensive anchor and anchor on the glass for them. This team has just been bad. I mean, they're sitting at 0-4, 27th in offensive rating, average defensively. They have by far the lowest transition frequency of the jaw era. Jaw's obviously not out there right now, but you see they've lost that dynamic that has made them a good offensive team. They're not rebounding well without Steven Adams. As we saw last year, 20th in rebound rate right now. They have sort of a strange offensive identity in the half court. It's not a very complimentary unit. There's not a lot of synergy. They're not really moving the ball. They're 28th in passes made. And then it's as I've talked about. They're not a very good shooting team. They don't have good athletes from the perimeter who are going to pressure the rim. And they don't have great playmakers who can create high quality looks for good play finishers around them. I mean, when you take John Adams out of this picture their best offensive player and not their best defensive player, but a very, very vital one to allowing Triple J to do what mm -hmm. he does best, being that real physical interior anchor, talking about Adams dominating the glass as he does, where Triple J is just not very good. You take those two parts of the equation away, and yeah, you're left with a basketball team that may have individual talents like Bain and Triple J, but those guys aren't equipped to carry a basketball team bain has played well triple j has been inconsistent offensively uh, this has been basically what i expected but even more so and i mean they've had a couple absences beyond even that but for the most part this has just been an ugly bad basketball team this has been a very ugly basketball team and i think it comes down to what you mentioned carson with this half court offense uh and the concern isn't when they get fully healthy or when they get jaw back you know, because I think this is going to be a good team then, but it's about the hole that they will have dug themselves to try and get out. And I think it's going to be an issue all year long, though. I like Xavier Tillman. You know, I like some of the other depth pieces here. Uh, I, You know, I don't think they can replace Steven Adams. And so him being out for the entire year really matters, too. Yeah. It's going to take this team collectively stepping up offensively when Ja gets back around him to make that leap. And I don't really know if that's a expectation that we have so are you do you seriously think that memphis could i know you predicted this do you still feel the same way that this team could miss out on the postseason well they're 0 four right now mm -hmm. so i definitely don't feel better about them than i did yeah i think that this west is so talented i mean with how the mavs are looking if the pelicans stay healthy there are so many teams that are more talented and healthier than the memphis grizzlies this year 100%. And I do want to emphasize this point, too. Right now, Memphis is 25th in half-court offense. That's without John Morant. And again, this team has never been an even above-average offense, uh, above-average half-court offense when John Morant is healthy. So that's an issue that's going to persist with Ja or without yeah. Ja. Uh, I didn't pick the Grizzlies to make the playoffs after the Adams injury either, and I still do feel the same way. This is a team that we've bought in with their culture and identity, but I think the, the talent loss may just be too much to overcome this season, man. I agree. One other team that I will say has disappointed me so far, the T-Wolves. I just see man. a team that has a lot of the same issues as last year, very congested offensively. It just doesn't really fit. You've got lots of labored possessions where the help is just too easy defensively because mm -hmm. somebody's already in the paint. Sometimes two guys are in the paint. Only 11% of Ant's shots right now are coming with inside of three feet. That's, to me, a testament to how congested things are. Cat is having to create lots of tough looks in isolation. I mean, they play slow because they've got two plotting bigs out there, so they don't get those easy transition opportunities that maybe you could make more of with an athlete like Ant if you had a more athletic team around him. 
We've seen coaching issues, late game issues with Chris Finch. Like, I thought this was a team that could trend in the right direction. Now, I still think the fundamental misfit between Gobert and Towns has been obvious, and that puts a ceiling on them if we're talking about them, like, contending. But I thought, all right, well, we, let's get a healthier cat. Let's get a better cat. Maybe they can get a little bit more comfortable offensively. We'll see Ant take a leap. Those things will push them up from being the eight seed to maybe the, I forget where I had them, the six seed or something like that. Just a solid step in the right direction, win six more games than last year. And unfortunately, it's been a very underwhelming start again. Dude, the Hawks game was abysmal. I was so fired up at halftime. I think they were up like 18 mm -hmm. or 19. Anthony Edwards was on an absolute burner, man. He had 20 yeah. points. He was knocking down every shot. I stopped watching the game. Dude, I was getting ready to, man, I was getting ready to, uh, come on here, be all fired up about the Timberwolves. And then I, I check at the end of the game, and they lost by 16. I don't know what the hell happened in the second half. All I know is that I was disappointed, and I, that's how I feel I will continue to be. Uh, if Anthony Edwards is on, you know, isn't on an absolute hot streak on pull-up shooting, on turnarounds, this offense is going yeah. to struggle. And 100%. I just feel like I'm going to be disappointed in the T-Wolves again. They need Ant to bail them out. They need Ant to bail them out by being superhuman far mm -hmm. too often it's just unreasonable to expect him to do that every single night so i'm disappointed by them <laughs> which young core or young player logan has disappointed you the most we've talked about how much exciting young talent there is but who's let you down the guy that has let me down the most has to be jordan pool uh Shout yeah. out, shout out friend of the show, uh, one of my friends from back home in Virginia, Sam Dietrich. Uh, he texted me day one of the NBA season, Jordan Poole for most improved. I'm hanging on for you, brother. I'll, I'll hold out hope. Um, nope. He is a struggling uh, and understandably uh, suffering Washington Wizards fan. Uh, I wish you the best, Sam. I'm, I'm hoping for, for better days. Shout out to Tupac. No. Um, Seriously, thoughts and prayers. Pool 19-3-3 on 39-22 splits with four turnovers a game. Yeah, that's about right, man. <laughs> that's about right. Uh, they've played like a 16-win team with Pool on the floor, and you know I'm coming to the reality that maybe the Washington Wizards are just a 16-win team. That's what I literally predicted for them. <laughs> they have an offensive rating of sub-110 with Pool. Get this, Carson. Without Pool on the court, they have an offensive rating of 103.5. Man, Sheesh. that's prime 2000s grimy basketball offensive rating yeah. right there. And I want to be clear about something. Look, man, I wasn't expecting Jordan Pool to lead the Washington Wizards to the playoffs or anything like that in this first year, but I was expecting more. I was just expecting, I don't know, man, more consistency, better decision-making, a more self-aware, unselfish Jordan Poole. I don't know why I expected it. I guess I was just, you know relentlessly optimistic and hopeful that we'd see a better Jordan Poole. He's got nine assists to 12 turnovers to open the season. We just see some classic Jordan Poole moments. This is a really deep cut. One of my favorite moments from Jordan Poole in his time with the Warriors, there was this one possession in the playoffs during their finals run. And I want to give an immense amount of credit for what Jordan Poole did in that playoff run and for what he did in the regular season last year. Mm -hmm. He was a huge part of that bench unit of scoring when Curry was off the floor. He was well. Let's not give him too much credit. Chris Paul has immediately significantly upgraded the bench unit. Very true. But when Poole was good, he was good, and he really helped yes. the bench unit. And 2022 playoffs, he was really, really good in in snapping lulls and just helping giving the Warriors some kind of punch when Curry wasn't out there. There was this one play I distinctly remember that ate me up against the Milwaukee. Or yeah, I don't know if it was against. Maybe it was a regular season game against the Bucks. It's a four-on-three fast break. Somebody has fallen at the end of the other court, and Poole walks the ball up the floor. If he just mm -hmm. made a pass up, it's an easy transition layup where it's an easy two points, and he just doesn't recognize it. It's a mental lapse. Pat Connaughton runs the all the way down the floor. They immediately lose their advantage. And I remember just thinking about that play going, man, you just have to have such a level of unawareness that it just doesn't mm -hmm. dawn on you, and that continues – to be an issue with pool just basketball iq knowledge and awareness man it's like pool just doesn't have a brain sometimes the transition three man where he back pedals and shoots a turnaround and porzingis yeah. just swats it what are you doing pool there's another one the swaggy p shooting the yeah. corner three where he turns around acting like he made it 
I don't know, man. The guy just doesn't get it. The things I have liked, there's been a little more added rim pressure. It's still not great, but he's been uh, 31% of his shots have come from the uh, at the rim. That's a career high for Poole. That's huge. And he's been really good off ball. He's a 91st percentile spot-up scorer. He's been league average in his career, but he's been really good to start this season. I hope that's an area where he continues to improve. Poole's just disappointed me, man. I... I I didn't want to see a crazy uptick in scoring or efficiency. Sure, that'd be nice, but I wasn't expecting it. I just wanted to see a smarter, more controlled player that played winning basketball, and I just don't think that's Jordan Poole. I don't think that's his game. I think he's a six-man that gets buckets, that plays his own game. I don't know if I can expect more. Poole's still young, but I don't know, man. There's only a certain amount of times he can show you the player that he is, and I think that yeah. if I expect more from Poole, I'm just being – you know, hopelessly optimistic. I think Jordan Poole is what he is. And I'll give an honorable mention. I've been disappointed in the Trailblazers and DeAndre Ayton, but I feel like I will be perpetually oh, yeah. disappointed by DeAndre Ayton. I'm not surprised about that either. Yeah, you're going to want to lower your expectations permanently with him. And same goes for Poole, honestly. He's sort of a basketball jester right now, <laughs> which is really a bummer because rookie year Jordan Poole, was one of the worst basketball players I've ever seen actually get rotation minutes. Inept defensively, wasn't the level of ball handler he'd become. Even shooting, he was terrible that year. He didn't do anything well. He only played because that was a terrible, terrible Warriors team that didn't have Steph Curry or Klay Thompson. And then to think about his improvement from that point, improving as a ball handler, as a shooter, as a playmaker, getting to the point where he could be sensational for a couple games where Steph is out in that title run and then just continue to do his job, play efficient basketball, bring that scoring juice. And we're not even two years removed from that. And he is just making a fool of himself in the situation that unfortunately is going to enable him to continue to do that because they have the furthest thing from a winning mm -hmm. culture. They are the furthest thing from a serious organization. I mean, they don't really even have like young pieces who they're going to prioritize over him at this point Koulibaly is their really high draft pick who is so raw offensively right he's so far away from being the sort of guy who you're gonna prioritize offensively so I am disappointed by Poole now I was not optimistic I was not buying the Jordan Poole explosion stock whatsoever throughout the offseason but it has been a really, really ugly start to the year. And I do think he is still a skilled basketball player. And if he could just figure it out mentally, it would make all the difference. Mm -hmm. But I don't really see reason to believe that right now. And I mean, even beyond like the standout stupid moments you see on social media, like he can always have this gear where he tries to do things that are too creative, too daring with the basketball, like split doubles when there's no room there and he just loses the ball. He's always been a very up and down experience, but it's more down than up right now. So I'm bummed for him. You mentioned the Blazers. Uh, yeah, I don't like Aiton and I didn't expect him to be good and he hasn't. Scoot has also really struggled. Mm -hmm. More turnovers than assists. Very inefficient as a scorer. I think a lot of that is just his jumpers are not falling and he maybe looks a little bit overwhelmed as a decision maker, but I still believe in him athletically and I'm not going to judge any rookie too harshly off of the first few games of their career. I agree with the Wizards. They're disappointing, but I thought they would suck. I also thought the Rockets would suck. Not that much though. And yet I feel like this is a team that for a couple years has just struggled to actually trend upwards. They've stockpiled these top draft picks. And I've liked some of these individual talents. Jalen Green right now feels to me like the mm. exact same player. A guy who's going to take questionable shots as an on-ball creator, who's not going to create efficient offense out of pick and roll, who's going to be a limited playmaker, who is not going to make the winning plays. And of course he's young, but at some point you think, all right, maybe new coach, some veteran presences. Maybe there's a bit of a cultural overhaul, maybe just as natural maturity he starts to make the most of his talent and he feels like the same player. Jabari Smith, I was very excited for throughout the offseason after we saw him in Summer League. I talked about how he was always my third favorite guy in his class behind Chet and Paolo and I had concerns about what scoring ceiling he could reach because of his discomfort putting the ball on the floor because he wasn't the most fluid athlete, most natural on-ball creator. 
And then I thought that we saw improvement from him, saw him more comfortable as a guy attacking downhill, putting the ball on the floor, saw some really impressive and versatile shot creation from the perimeter. And now he's off to a very underwhelming start this year, mostly being utilized as a spot up guy like last year. And it's a crazy small sample size, but he's been shooting very poorly. And last year he shot way worse than I expected him to. So I thought, all right, that'll even things out. And it's just been an underwhelming start. And then Thompson's not playing a bunch and he hasn't been great. I mean, his brother Asar has certainly popped way more with his defensive and athletic and rebounding contributions. We've seen 10 minutes of Cam Whitmore, who was one of my favorite value picks in the draft. Like I'm certainly not out on the entirety of this core, but when you think about how everybody else, we basically mentioned every other promising young core and raved about them. Mm-hmm. The Thunder playing real t- winning basketball right now. The Pacers in the Magic working their way into those playoff conversations. The Pistons with this defensive culture, multiple dudes really looking like they've taken the leap. And there's one organization where everything just feels stagnant, and that is still the Houston Rockets right now. 100%. I mean, even in comparison, I, these teams have struggled relatively. Even Utah has had flashes, right? The Spurs seem like they've leapfrogged the just with Wemby. Oh, my yeah. God. Well, not just with Wemby, dude. Vassell's pull-up shooting has been awesome. Trey Jones is making winning plays. Talked about how we like Zach Collins. Like, that is a way better basketball team than the Rockets. And, honestly, one of the guys I've been I, – I think Jabari's been good defensively. I want to give him a shout there. I think he's yep. impressed me there. I know he struggled offensively. The guy that honestly has disappointed me the most is probably Fred Van Vliet, though, man. Like, I, I know that he struggled – Last year, uh, in terms of shooting, he was one of the most inefficient volume shooters in the NBA. And I probably should have taken that and ran with it a little more. But I expected, oh, man, they didn't have a true point guard. He's at least going to come in here and set the table for guys. But he has been horribly inefficient and just looks bad. And Jalen Green is actually probably the most disappointing, at least with Jabari. There's a shooting ceiling that I expect to finally come along. He's a good defender. I just don't know if Jalen Green knows how to play basketball, man. And a lot of the things I mentioned with Jordan Poole, less to that of Green, I just don't know if Green can play winning basketball, man. He's another guy that feels like maybe, I don't know, man, is a six man. I just, Jalen Green feels like one of those go and get your own ball kind of guys, man. And it's really frustrating mm-hmm. to watch a guy this talented struggle to play winning basketball. I have been thoroughly disappointed uh, with the Houston Rockets this season. And I never want to write off a 21-year-old, especially a guy Mm -hmm. who's been in such a bad culture. But eventually, he's just got to take some responsibility, and he's got to take the steps on his own. And yeah, it would be nice for him to play alongside a great playmaker. Freddie is a guy who's just a bit labored in the half court offensively still, right? Super limited athlete, Mm -hmm. small. So that was never going to make the Rockets like a much better basketball team. I mean, I had the Rockets as my 14 seed, so it's not like I loved them compared to some of these other young cores that I thought they would really take a big step forward. But, I mean, Jalen Green was such a talented scoring prospect. I did expect Jabari to progress. I think a man has such a unique skill set, and they just continue to underwhelm, and that bums me out a little bit. So we'll end on that note, Logan. Everybody bummed out. But <laughs> there's been a lot of good stuff, lots to be excited about in the NBA this season so we will continue to talk about it and if you want more nerd sesh content if you want to hear us talk about the nba and the nfl more you can find all of our full shows at the volume youtube page with video and you can listen across audio platforms you can also follow us across social media tiktok and instagram at nerd sesh twitter at nerd underscore sesh you can join our discord if you want to talk nba nfl with us be part of our community that is at the link tree across our social media bios and you can also check out our merch. We've got hats, we've got shirts, we've got hoodies, we got the flags behind us. You can find all that at thevolume.com. And with that, as always, appreciate you guys. I've been Carson Brabber. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sesh. Nerd Sesh.